I'm Danny Dyer, and this is the Real Football Factories. I played Tommy Johnson in the movie The Football Factories, which was all about football violence. But that was just acting. Now I'm on a journey around the country meeting the real firms who have mass offs at football matches for real. No fake blood, no stuntmen, no makeup. This time it's just me and the country's hardest hooligans. I meet the real top boys who tell you the score. Welcome to the Real Football Factories. For tonight's show, I'm in the North West. It's a tale of two cities, Liverpool and Manchester. This part of the world has seen some of the worst football violence and tragedy imaginable. <laughs> It's not surprising, as it's home to two of the biggest footballing cities we've got, Liverpool and Manchester. The two cities are home to four Premiership football teams and boast the most famous and successful British clubs, Liverpool and Manchester United. But with success comes a deep hatred and bitter rivalry that stems from the history of the two places. I'm on a journey to find out why they hate each other so much. I'll meet some of the firm's top boys and see what happens at a Liverpool Man U grudge match in the FA Cup. When the two teams clash, it's like a war zone. Liverpool's urchins versus Manchester's notorious Red Army. The hooligans, I reckon the hooligans these fellas are today. The roots of the hatred between the two go back in time. Manchester United and Liverpool in general were golf, but it still escalates to Manchester and Liverpool. It goes back to the Docker days. In the 70s, with the nation in the midst of economic decline, the Manchester Ship Canal took business from Liverpool docks. Eventually they closed. It goes back historically to when the Manchester Ship Canal was built. When the big ships started bypassing Liverpool and going directly to Manchester docks, the Liverpoolians, you know, took exception to it. Aggravation, aggravation, <laughs> la, 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 la. With the docks closing and mass unemployment in the region, young men needed an outlet to vent their anger. Because you had young men who were totally disaffected, very, very angry with the world, and would use football as a vessel to achieve some sort of stance, some sort of statement about what they were feeling. I'm going to start my story in the city of Liverpool, a place where high unemployment helped create a new social phenomenon, football hooliganism. I'll put it this way, if someone comes to me, you know, and you're standing there, you can't hold back because you get killed. But the one thing Liverpool did have going for it was a hugely successful team. This gave the people of Liverpool a sense of pride. Football became like a religion to them. But the Manchester football teams were not as successful. And this increased the rivalry between the two towns. One group of United supporters runs down to the cop, Liverpool's end, and police soon chase after them. Five minutes before kickoff, fighting near the United end, the police quickly step in. Ten people were arrested in all. 24 were thrown out of the ground and four people were stabbed with craft knives, including a police officer. From 1977 to 1984, Liverpool won the European Cup four times and travelled all over Europe in the process. The Liverpool supporters came home with sportswear and designer clothes from their travels and they wore them back home on the terraces. The casual look was born and became the iconic terrace wear adopted around the country. This bred even more jealousy from Manchester, as Liverpool would rub their faces in it on the terrace catwalk. It was a kind of badge of honour that they'd been abroad and knit these things, and it became a fashion statement from there. A competitive nature about how you look, how you appear, 
we come from whatever part of the country, we can afford more than you can. So you're walking down my street, well, you look like me. The Liverpool mob rampaged around Switzerland, France and Italy, leaving a host of burgled sports shops in their wake. They basically pillaged their way across Europe. Scouse Vikings, they used to just, anything that wasn't nailed down, they'd take. They were just astonished at how easy it was because, you know, these places weren't expecting anyone. You'd see lads on a Saturday who hadn't worked all their fucking lives wearing Rolexes. You know, where'd you get that from, mate? Uh, you haven't saved for it. You haven't saved for it out your gyro for a Rolex, have you? You know, and then a couple of weeks later they'd sell it on and they'd go on the next trip. The bizarre label soon became the must-have terrace wear for any self-respecting hooligan. What's that on his shirt? Oh, it's a crocodile. A crocodile? Is he into animals or something? Oh, everyone's wearing it. Fred Perry, Lacoste. Timberland, the Stone Island, the Burberry. Things like Sergio Tacchini tracksuits. These were the tracksuits that the kind of local bourgeois would use to their tennis clubs. And they'd come back and wear them and they became the fashions. Oh, where have you got that from? Oh, got it abroad when Liverpool were playing so and so. You'd be searching high and low, you get, you get your wages and just you traipse around the shops for hours looking for it. Liverpool is where the casual movement was born, a look that swept the country in the 80s. Retro 80s casual fashion has become big business. I went and checked out some of the gear in the local shops. So I'm at a gaff called Tasuti. I'm going to make some geezer that's going to tell me exactly what they'd wear on the terraces in the northwest. So you've got some proper gear here, haven't you? I met Jay, the shop manager, who showed me his extensive collection of original 80s terrace wear. That is nice, though. Lovely demo. That is nice. Oh, you can get away with that now, easy, mate. Yeah, oh, easy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, all day long. Juicy. Juicy. Pink cardigan, look. All coming back in this now. That's what I know, I know. I don't mind a bit of pink myself, but. Yeah. That's what I'm saying, look, you've got to be able to hold your hands up and run about in that, innit? You? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm loving the gear, but Jay had a few things to say that opened my eyes to how important clothes are on the terraces. It's like a working class man's catwalk. Mm. You know what I mean? It's the way I see it. You get to the football. On a Saturday, you want to be wearing. What's the point in you know buying your latest Fal Raven coat? Mm. Where, where, where are you going to wear it? Mm. Yeah. What are you going to do? Yeah. It's yeah. the football. Yeah. It's yeah. working class. You know, it's, true. it's, it's one upmanship. You got a favourite piece? My favourite all time. All time favourite piece. I mean, most people would go for the green BJ because really? because it's so iconic. It's 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 like the mythical. Some people don't even believe it exists, do you know what I mean? The yeah. green BJ, it's, you know, it's so hard to get okay. and stuff like that. So Jay's an 80s clothes fanatic, but he's not a football hard man. So how do the real hooligans use terrace fashion when they're going to the football? If you want to look like a lad and act like a lad, you get treated like a lad. And that's the uniform you wear at football. Basically, if you wear Stone Island, you're classed as a lad. If you wear designer gear, you're classed as a lad. If you wear a shirt, you're classed as a supporter. If you see 50 shirts, you don't touch them because you're not interested. If you see 10 designer gear lads walking down the street, you know they're interested. You know, designer gear is an hooligan. Clothes on the terraces have evolved into a uniform, a way of identifying each other. Hooligans stopped wearing team scarves and shirts. The designer label was what made them part of the firm. So next time you go to a football match, be careful what you wear. Don't turn up in your best designer labels, or you could end up in trouble. In part two, we'll see the terrible events involving Liverpool fans that entirely changed the face of football in this country forever. I'll meet the top boys from Manchester and Liverpool who describe the battles on the streets and how the firms had to become organised. By God, did you get some good ideas down there. Came down here looking for you, get it, quite simple. Done, yeah. Welcome to part two of the Real Football Factories, where this week I'm in the Northwest. In part one, we looked at the bitter rivalry between Liverpool and Manchester and the mass battles that went on between their two biggest clubs. Over the years, Liverpool thugs had a reputation for taking European towns by storm and regularly caused trouble in grounds around the continent. This caused the horrific disaster at the European Cup final between Liverpool and Juventus, which shocked the world. On the 29th of May, 1985, 39 Italian spectators died in the Hazel Stadium disaster. 
Heysel marked the beginning of a new era in football hooliganism. Heysel was a kind of epitome of the what was appeared to be at first a fairly harmless charge. Just a few people running around. That's what hooliganism used to be, but the consequences of that were awful. They tried to run away, but a concrete wall blocked the escape route. It collapsed, crushing those on the other side. And it was just amazing that no one had ever seen that, that something awful was going to happen before long. And it took something like Heisel for the people to, to wake up. Hooliganism was now front page news. Suddenly the world was watching and politicians had to take notice. I wish we could get those responsible, get them before a court and stiff sentences so that they stop anyone else in their tracks from doing this. Yet more tragedy was to follow the club. But this time it had nothing to do with hooliganism. Hillsborough was the worst disaster in British football history. I paid my respects at the Anfield Memorial to the 96 Liverpool fans who lost their lives at the Hillsborough tragedy in 1989. This horrific event forced the government to act. It would change the face of football forever. Heisel and Hillsborough changed everything. Hillsborough more so than Heisel because it changed the design of stadiums. The game started to tidy itself up, especially looking after fans, putting grounds in order and making the places safe to go to. This was a turning point in British football. The standing terrace became a thing of the past. All top flight clubs had to rebuild the stadiums to become all seaters with tighter security, better turnstiles and more expensive tickets. This drove the hooligans out onto the streets. So what's happened in the past 15 years, 20 years since those disasters is a kind of social cleansing of football, a deliberate pricing policy that has pushed hooliganism they thought to the back burner. The football crews who caused the problems uh, uh, had to find somewhere else to cause the problems because grounds were cleaned up. That's when things really did change. The idea of uh, organising rendezvous uh, anywhere other than the grounds. Hooligans were forced to organise fights away from the grounds. They formed gangs that became synonymous with the clubs. Liverpool were the urchins. Manchester had the Red Army or the intercity jibbers. Man City were the young governors. And Everton, the county road cutters. Hatred became set in stone. Firms from the cities Manchester and Liverpool still do battle on the streets to this day. It doesn't matter if Man U play Liverpool or Everton. Whenever they're in town, they get it from all sides. Everton's ground, Goodison Park, is just a stone's throw from Anfield. In 2005, Manchester United and Everton clashed on the streets in the Battle of Everton Valley. It kicked off when Man United brought newly signed Wayne Rooney back to Everton for the first time. The unhappy Evertonians wanted revenge for losing their favourite son and 30 to 40 of the hardcore Red Army hooligans were the unlucky recipients of their wrath. This morning, riots mar Everton defeat. Radio City 96.7 News. This is, in fact, been described as the worst football violence ever to take place on Merseyside. In fact, many say on the inside at Merseyside Police that it's the worst that they have come across. So this is Everton Valley, where I'm going to meet Andy Nichols, who's going to tell me about a proper battle between Man United and Everton. Andy Nichols is known to police as a Category C hooligan, the worst kind. He's been nicked over 20 times for football violence, and he's banned for life from every football ground in the country. 
25 years I've known it, only about three clubs have ever bothered to come down here. Uh, West Ham did. They were done in. Middlesbrough came down this one, did better than most, and Southampton were the only other one who come down here, really. Came down here looking for it, you'd get it, quite simple. I've done it. Very few grounds like this were in built up housing estates and with the terraces running alongside it where it would just be, uh, it'd be a paradise, it'd just be hooligans paradise basically. And? Hello Dan. Pleasure to meet you Stan. And you mate. Right? Yeah, listen, I just want you to tell me a little bit about this battle that you had with Man United. United, yeah. 30 of their main lads peeled off. Right. Called it on. Everton had 200 and filled them in. Well, they, they did all right. They, they did as well as they could. They just, well, they weren't good enough. But the myth is that they, they, they were just that little gang and they went out looking for it. The fact is, two and a half hundred of their mates stood from here to that wall away mm -hmm. in a mystery escort which was broken by Everton. And that's, that's where the myth of it comes and the annoying part is they've done well with the numbers game for 20 years, United, yeah. and no one can. No one can give them grief for that because they pulled numbers in year in, year out. They're the only ones that carried it on for 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. But when they come unstuck, they, they use the like numbers it. game against them. Andy met up with Eddie Beef, one of Man United's former top boys, who's been no stranger to street battles over the years. Andy and Eddie were arch rivals who regularly fought each other on the streets in the old days. Eddie had a different version of the Battle of Everton Valley. Man United stood the ground and got beat up. Not beat up. There was less numbers, yeah? And I wasn't there personally myself. A few of my friends was. They got hijacked off about fucking 200 people. There's only 40 of them. And that's why they think they'd done Man United, but they didn't really. Seriously, they never did and never will. Because we're out of fucking nails. So cut the bullshit now, right? Come mate. Because that's sort of fucking shite, isn't it? You were doing well there, weren't you? Oh, you were doing well there until all the wank. You're not slinging it in, you're talking shite. At the end of the day, right? Oh, you're throwing this At the end of the fucking club. day now, right? You always play the numbers game, United. Right? So answer me this truthfully always now. Always had the big numbers, though, haven't we? Always had the big numbers, never take that away from you. That. So last year now, you're fucking 500 are getting escorted out of Goodison. Go on. And you're 40 break away. Correct. Correct and get mullered. They got fucking leathered. They got leathered. Where was the other fucking four and a half hundred? The police had all of them. 20 police stopped four and a half hundred. The police So you use it to your advantage, and then when it goes tits up, you use it to your disadvantage. You know what, me and they him were done. fucking hate each other, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you got done. That's the one thing they won't do is hold their hands yeah, up and say we got done down. fair and square. I'm not surprised they can't agree, so I'll leave them to it. That's it, that's what pisses me off about you. Anyway. Quite... My journey took me from Liverpool to nearby Manchester, the home of the notorious Red Army. It's only 30 miles away, but Old Trafford is a different world, all gleaming glass and neon. Through the 70s, United developed a reputation for being the most feared hooligan firm in, in the country, and the worst, or, or the nadir, was reached in the period when they were relegated at the end of the... Uh, 1973 season, they went into the second division and basically terrorised the market towns of England. The Red Army are the most active firm in the North West. Every year they have more arrests than any other club. In 2005, 160 Man United fans were arrested at football matches and more than 100 were banned from games. Double the number for any other team in the region. Colin Blaney, a Red Army regular, is well qualified to tell tales of the violent past. I don't think anywhere has seen as much mob battles as this. The mob's ever uncontrollable. And it's a bottleneck as well. And when they used to clash, it was that bad that you'd just all be absolutely gobsmacked at what happened on that side. A lad lost his eye, sadly enough, here. And the weapon that was used was thrown down there. Quite a bad day, that really. And that was 10 past three when the kickoff had already gone off. There was one almighty rumble at the back on the Stretford End Bridge. 
And that's the only time there's ever been trouble at that side of the ground. The trouble was always here on the forecourt. By God, did you get some good ideas down there, because that's a bottleneck again, splits into two. That was a trap, that. And obviously, we knew it and would lure them into these kind of traps. That's just one of them. There's plenty more down there. Pandemonium running battles up and down here. Manic mayhem. Usually, there were traps in these side streets for up to 10, 20 minutes, which in football is a long time. Three, four minutes is a long time in the ring. Never mind five, 10, 15 minutes in these streets. No control once it hits the side streets, the police here. Not a chance. All you can do is chase you with horses and I suppose the big sticks and batons come out. Manchester United's firm are also known as the Intercity Jibbers, notorious for robbing their way around the country. Unlike Liverpool, who ransacked shops around Europe, Manchester United's firm did their robbing much closer to home. The reputation at that time period was like nobody could touch us. Well, nearly every shop that was along the front here, nearly every pub, every kind of person who was selling merchandise at that time would be not attacked, but we would have them over somewhere along the line. All the cash that was generated around here, we was taking half of it. In them days, it, it was just mob rule, mobbing and a robbing, we called it. Just a few miles from Old Trafford used to stand Main Road, the old stadium of Manchester United's nearest neighbours and bitter rivals, Manchester City. Main Road was in the infamous Moss Side district. The stadium was hidden amongst dark streets and old terraced housing. Main Road was a perfect location for hooligan activity. Even in the post hills were a police crackdown, fighting could break out around the stadium especially when United were in town. This clash between Manchester's rival gangs was arranged on the phone two weeks in advance. Youths arrived carrying a wooden club, rocks and bottles. After some stone throwing and jeering, the United fans are chased off. But as he runs away, one is caught and dragged to the ground. He's surrounded and repeatedly and brutally kicked. But the man seen here throwing a stone hasn't finished with him. As he lies defenceless, the attacker runs over and jumps on him, stamping on his head. The injured man survived, cut and badly bruised, probably owing his life to changing fashions in footwear. Fans now prefer soft trainers to hard leather boots. Everything. So I've learned that the North West is a tale of two cities with four major teams. We've seen the major firms of Liverpool and Everton and met the crews from Manchester's big clubs. But what happens today when the two biggest teams of the North West clash in a crunch match in the cup? We'll find out in part three as Liverpool take on Man United at Anfield. This is part three of the real football factories. And this week we're looking at the firms of the North West. In part two, I went to Liverpool and Manchester and saw one of the biggest footballing rivalries in the country. I was going to see what happens when the two cities meet in an epic clash with the possibility of a mass brawl. The FA Cup draw has brought these two giant cities together again in a historic battle. I think it's inevitable there's going to be one hell of a clash somewhere. Be it at the train station, be it away from the ground, something will go on. WFM 97.2, today's subject, hooliganism in sport. I would be very worried going to the game and coming away from it. Liverpool fans against Manchester United fans, it's going to be... I'd, I'd love a inside ticket, I'd love a inside ticket. The old foes of Liverpool and Man U met at Anfield. Liverpool haven't beaten their rivals in the FA Cup for 85 years. But it's more than just football. It's city versus city, as the two Goliaths meet in an epic encounter. The police will have to show their mettle to keep the lid on this game. 
I was there at Anfield. On the morning of the match, I saw the police marshal a huge amount of Man U fans from the station, making sure nothing kicked off. The police escorted the Manchester United fans from Manchester Piccadilly to Liverpool Lime Street. Their presence on the train was to protect normal passengers. When they arrived at Lime Street, the police searched fans using the new Section 60 ruling that allows them to search any football fans who are travelling to and from a football match. Man U lost a match, and I was suddenly surrounded by angry Man U fans spoiling for a fight. So I had to slip off sharpish. Man United brought 6,000 to Anfield, and if they'd have bumped into the Liverpool faithful, it would have had dramatic consequences. So, how does the old Bill manage to prevent a mass brawl on the streets of Liverpool? By keeping the fans apart. But let me tell you now, that is a tricky business. <laughs> So the cops, they managed to get the Liverpool fans away from the ground. Fuck off, man, you! Go on! You need to... Uh... And what they did was is they formed a hardcore barrier of riot police across here just to hold them back. They've then released the Man United fans who are baying for Scouse blood. Now, they've all come out here looking for a tear-up, but for their disappointment, no one here. So the cops managed to keep the angry man you mob away from the Liverpool fans, and they marched them down the long road towards Liverpool Lime Street Station. The Liverpool police managed to escort the Red Army back to Lime Street, where they handed them over to the BTP who prepared for the onslaught. Let's follow them through. Every Saturday, train stations around the country are like war zones. Armoured riot police everywhere, just in case. Just wait, please. Go on the train, stop those. We have to tell you again, you won't be going anywhere, mate. All right, buddy. The police escorted the huge numbers of Man United fans back to Manchester in a successful operation. The police seem to be keeping a lid on it, especially in big cities. My journey took me away from the big towns into unknown territory, where the breeding ground for thugs is still alive. I'd been invited to Burnley, to meet a firm of notorious hooligans, the Suicide Squad. I've come across some naughty people now, so... You know, the only thing that worries me is the fact that... i got you with me, yeah, who's holding the camera, and no-one can see you, and you wear about, you wear about as much as a Rizzler paper. I've got a treacle with me, I've got some geezer with a clipboard, and we're going into a pub that's got the Suicide Squad in there. <laughs> should be a laugh, should be a right laugh. Unlike most of the top boys in football firms, Andy Porter bears no bones about saying exactly who he is. I'm Drew Porter, 39 year old, 40 this year, and I'm a football hooligan. Simple as that. Andy Porter, top boy of Burnley's suicide squad. He's been in and out of prison all his life for football related violence. This is where to where most of the battles occur down here. This is where all the away fans come down there, you know, to the away parking down there. They just ambushing on these streets here. And that massive car park up there, away fans park on there. They come from down here up there, we all meet here. No police, nothing. Two sets of lads having enough eight. 
all these back streets around there, uh, it was good for us because we knew where every back street, where they were going. Away from us, didn't know where they were going, but we, we could ambush them every back street if we wanted, do you know what I mean? These are the streets, just good hunting grounds. And he's been involved in football violence since his teens. He's banned for life from all football grounds, and he has the press cuttings to prove it. Just all that hot burn and shit and all that. That's me getting nicked in 88 Germany. We just give it the Germans and police and just had a riot. That's one of our lads, Italy. This is where I went, you know, Kilburn, the West Brom sent that up. Took 300 lads down and just fucked them. You know, it's just, they, they show a challenge to you, don't they? <laughs> Saying they're going to kill you, but fair play to them. All right, they're down, going down forces now. All right, just going in here. So I've been stabbed, had my leg broke and everything. I love it. I've got a family and all that lot, and that's why I'm semi-retired and just go to big games. Really could do with putting us in a big field and let us have it. In the 80s and 90s, it was better than sex, you know? Better than sex. The nice blonde there, or football violence, you go for the football violence, great to date. Mick and Simon are Andy's main lieutenants, and they've fought side by side many times. Football comes really last. It's more about the lads all together going to the matches, getting around, pissing other people off, owning the place and having a good day. It's not just a 90 minute thing, it's just. Wow. If he has a problem, you can we sort it. If he has a. Everyone sorts it, everyone's together. Your shit in the same pot. I say it's a game, it's us against them. That's it, really. It's like when you used to play soldiers when you were kids and that lot, little armies. That's how it does, isn't it? Yeah. It is. Yeah. Andy and his Burnley crew are the modern hooligan. They operate in small clandestine crews. The days of the big mobs are fucking gone. <coughs> days of 200 going here and there, it's gone. Place yes. are two on top, it's better now you're fucking 10 against 10. 20 good lads tucked together, not in the foot, it's an 100. If you're not moving and taking a backward step, you're not fucking moving, is it? There's no one going to move you. No. That's it. As soon as you All get there. Don't you know, there. That's why you get kicked to no. fuck, because you know what fucking move. Just wait for slashings to stop, don't you? Yeah. But 20 good lads is a mob, and you will not move. All knowing what they're doing together, you won't fucking move them. I don't give a fuck what team you come from. So I've left the glitz of the big cities, the big teams and their feared firms, and I've come to the small mill town of Burnley. I wouldn't have thought this was an obvious choice, Burnley. I'm going to be honest with you, you know. I'm, I know, I'm a bit surprised that I've come here. Um, I've been assured that these, this little firm have got something to say. Step off the train on our own at dawn, back into the home where I was born. Burnley seems to be a place untouched by the social cleansing and corporate world of the modern big cities. Burnley is one of the most deprived places in Britain. Most of the cotton mills, all of the coal mines, and some of the engineering firms have closed. There are few jobs here. A lot of homes are derelict, but people still live in them. It's a perfect breeding ground for football hooligans. I ain't got a clue what's going to happen when I walk in this boozer. Go either way, they might gam me, might love me. I mean, it all depends on whether they like the film or not. Because if I don't like the film, I'm fucked. <laughs> Forrester's arms, right? Suicide squad. Let's go and see what they've got to say. It's the turn. All right, boys. All right, son. Pleasure to meet you, bruv. Pleasure yeah, to meet you, son. So this is your boozer then, yeah? Well, one of them. Yeah? Well, I want to ask you first. Thanks for talking to me, son. Anyway, I appreciate that. Suicide Squad, right? Now, where's that come from? That's a right mad name. 
because when suicide bombers started in Lebanon in '83 and that, and that's it. We just we called the Burnley crew at first. What? And this lad just come up to the suicide squad because we bought suicide bombers and walked from one pub to another, got a card printed, okay. sorted in ten minutes. So, well, as soon as I was told it, I thought, well, that Sam right a right naughty bunch of people. Now I didn't know too much about you, so yeah. I was a bit like, you know what I mean? Are you sure we're going to walk in this booze? We're going to end up getting ironed out by this little firm, you know what I mean? Yeah. But you seem sweet as, but it's early days yet, you know what I mean? I'm sure yeah. someone's going to glass me anyway. <laughs> Only joking. <laughs> it seemed to be going really well until I put my foot right in it. You know, you, you're quite a small club, and you know you've got a naughty little firm, but no, not not many firms. I suppose firms up here know about you. But, you, you know, you, you're almost like in the background, you know what I mean? No, it's can like... you say hello, mate? You can, we can go down London and turn you over. <laughs> Simple as that. Any big team comes to burn there, they have it. Simple as that, they fucking do. Yeah. It is. You ask Man United, ask fucking Liverpool. Ask. You come to burn there, you'll have a row. You want it, you'll get it. You know when you're new, they can, if when you get sent to prison, right, yeah. you come out and want to do the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah. Otherwise, that's how you love it. Yeah. And if you don't love it like that, you don't do it again, do no, you? No, no, that's true. If you don't like jail, don't fucking do the crime. Yeah. Simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. If you just come out of it and hooligan again and go bang, 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 every time I've been nicked is through violence, through hooliganism yeah. and riots. Yeah. And that's it. When you've done as much jail as me, football hooligans don't fucking bother me. No. You know what I mean? I've done fucking jail sentence after jail sentence after jail for football hooligans. I mean, it don't fucking bother me. No. You come out, they all say it rehabilitates you. It don't. No, of course it don't. It fucking, you're born with it. That like Beckham were born, he didn't learn his fucking skill, he was yeah, born with yeah, it. Yeah. Rembrandt were painter, were fucking born, he didn't learn to paint a fucking brilliant painting, did he? <laughs> fucking didn't, did he? No, 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 no. Fucking no. hell, they're born with it in the fucking jeans, innit? Yeah, it? yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you got it in you, ain't you? You either got it in you, or you ain't. You either like to hold your hands up or you don't. It's just, you're, just, you're born with it, ain't you? Of course you're born with it. And that's what it's about, you know what I mean? If you ain't, if you ain't doing it on the terraces, you're going to be doing it somewhere else. It's just it's that are. violent streak. No, it's not a violent streak, it's being proud. Being proud of your man? Yeah, yeah, being proud of your man. I mean, fucking don't let people take the piss out of you. Yeah. Basically, that's it. Be, be proud. Be a proud man. No one takes the piss. They're defending your patch, innit? Of course it is, yeah. Territories. I met the younger boys. They have their own firm. Pleasure to meet you. How old are you two? 19. 19. These teenage lads had already been in trouble for their part in football related violence. I've just been caught Thursday now, so I fancy. Oh, really? Yeah. Got off with a fucking two year conditional discharge. But, uh, For what? Just standing there? Or did you, did they, they catch you on the, did they catch you on the radio? Yeah, CCTV. They so got you on that? Like, yeah, about 10 of us. Really? When, you, I mean, when you're looking at a bit of bird, is that, is that a deterrent or do you think, fuck it, I don't give a fuck, I just want to kick right off? It's pissed out, yeah, but fucking boys, you love it. You yeah. Know what I mean? Yeah. You want it? You just, for it, it? If you're used to, I mean, for them lot, they don't, they don't really, it don't matter about the result. What about you? Does it matter about the result in the football, or is it just about having a tear up? Glad to me, it's both. Yeah. I like football. That's why the passion comes into. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I mean? I then met the rest of the squad, and Phil told me about when he was attacked by a police dog. Police dog attacked me. Yeah. They got me. Just we were all burning lads were fighting with uh, police, weren't we? Outside, outside club and spindle. So I fucking, I thought, fuck this and that. The dogs were all over me, more than me, running loose, running loose. I just fucking got over it, pinned it down and I was smashing it on fucking floor. And then I thought, fuck this, and I picked it up, threw it right into place. And that's no fucking word of a lie. I fucking hate them, hate them bastards. Hey, I've got it there, look. Fuck the police. Phil got six months for his assault on the police dog. I thought it was time to leave as I realised I was dealing with some dangerous people. Come up here a bit. That's exactly what I, 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 that's exactly what I expected, to be honest. Now, now these are nutters, these, this little firm. This takes it to a new level because they've got absolutely no fear of anything. They don't care about anybody. They're very, very passionate about... They don't care about the result either very passionate about Burnley, about their manner, which I would have thought was quite a hard thing to do, really, you know what I mean? But uh, these are naughty people. This is the new generation, I would have thought, you know? This is the, you know, this is the, this is the class of people that really just do not care at all about anything. They don't care about a thing. Andy Porter's your hardened hooligan. With a resolve like his, it seems hooliganism is here to stay. In part four, we find out what the future holds for the hooligan. Welcome to part four of the Real Football Factories.
I've met top men from the main firms of the Northwest, and I've heard their stories. They don't seem to be ashamed of what they've done. I have no regrets. The jails, the slashings, I have no regrets whatsoever. I loved it. Even the bad times, jail, bad times, but you get over it, you make it good times. I have no regrets whatsoever, because this is what I was supposed to do. But some ex-hooligans did have regrets when remembering their violent past. I regret witnessing innocent people, quite a lot who used to get injured. And I know in every book you read, every sort of organised hooligan firm say, we only look for the ones who want trouble, and they look for us. That, that is half true, but believe you me, there's a lot of people get caught up as casualties. The original hooligans are now grown up with children of their own. But how are the football factories working today? Is there a new generation coming through the ranks? It's quite bizarre when you watch middle-aged men pointing and gesticulating and drunk. You've got to think to yourself, if that's a dad, and like I say, maybe a granddad, what sort of role model is that person anyway? I sit and look at it now and I think, I won't like my lad to be in that situation. I won't like anybody to be in that situation, whether he's an Arsenal fan, Liverpool fan, whatever. If I had a lad now who was 14, 15, and he was telling me, look, I'm going with the lads to the football, I'd do everything I could to stop him going, because it's changed that much. Andy Nichols finally saw the error of his ways. He retold the tale of when he realised he had to hang up his bother boots. And one thing that brought it home to me was about four years ago, um, obviously I was well known and the police obviously had files on me and um, a cop came up to me at Birmingham and said, oh, you were nicked here in 84, weren't you? And I said to him, yeah, oh, were you on duty? He said, no, I was in fucking school, isn't it about time you grew up? And I think that day it was like a big hammer at me on the head thinking, whoa, hang on. Brought it home earlier, but uh, it's time to pack in, I think. With Andy's father on his deathbed, the reality of what he's done came crashing down. And it just brings home again, I mean, he was in hospital, short illness, he was very, very poorly, we knew he wouldn't be coming out and, you know, you got a lot of time to reflect then, you know, you're sitting alongside the hospital bed watching someone who's brought you up and probably, uh, you know, wanted the best out of you in life and then it kind of brings it home, of probably the shame and the upset you've caused him over the years. I'd only ever said sorry when my dad was alive for the way I was. Probably wish you would have done that. Yeah, probably wish you would have done. Oh well. But what does the future hold for a young private coming through the football factory production line? Andy Porter does have a son, and he's at a ripe age to be conscripted into the army of the suicide squad. You don't breed some of what's in you. Do you know what I mean? You don't learn it, you don't. You're just fucking in you. You never learn a trade like that. But it's him in, it's in my jeans, it must be in his jeans. He wants to be a footballer again. And if he wants to be one, so be it. I've told him how it is, get him trouble, go to jail. Live and fight another day. You know what you sound? Wanna be in here again? That's the next generation of youth. Coming through all the time. You'll never take it out of us. So, fancy going to a Premiership game of your choice next season as a VIP? Then why not visit bravo.co.uk where you and a mate could win an exclusive posh footy package. The prize includes a three-course lunch, complimentary bar, post-match refreshments and a match programme too, and it's free to enter. So log on to bravo.co.uk right now to be in with a chance of winning. That's bravo.co.uk. The competition closes on May 24th and you've got to be over 18 to 